Welcome to VCU Health Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Black History Month celebration. We are so happy that everyone is here today. Um, before we begin, I would like to introduce Mr. Muzi Branch. He is the Director of VCU Health Arts in, the, in Healthcare. Um, and without Muzi, we would not have been able to be here today. Um, so thank you, Muzi, and I'll turn over the floor to you. Thank you, Dr. Joanne, and welcome to this lecture series, our first of our lecture series for Black History Month. I'm Director of Arts and Healthcare, P. Muzi Branch, and I just want to give you a little overview of what we do with arts and healthcare. It, we use arts in the healing process here at the hospital. We serve everyone from our patient staff and visitors. We have five focus areas. The healing environment, all the artwork and how it looks in the facility is under our department. Patient care, we have music therapy, dogs on call, pet therapy, and art intervention. We also have caring for our caregivers, things that we do for our employees. We also have community outreach. We have galleries in the hospital that we show artwork from the community and we work with community partners to bring activities into the hospital for our patients and our guests. And we do education and research. So with that, I just want to welcome everyone to this, our first lecture in this series. We have the next two are on Tuesday. This one is Wednesday, but the next ones are on Tuesday. And I just want to thank you, Dr. Tillerson Brown for being with us today. Thank you so much, Muzi. Again, I feel so blessed that you were able um, to definitely help us make this happen today. So again, so February marks Black History Month in American culture. Um, although Cardi G. Woodson um, founded Black History Week in 1926, it wasn't until 1976 that Black History Month was established as an annual observance in the United States. I just want y'all to know that was after I was born. So it was not long ago. <laughs> Black History Month was created to focus attention on the contributions of African-Americans in the United States. It honors all Black people from all periods of US history. Within today's current context, this time of year has an even greater meaning for many in this country as the significant social dynamics and human rights movements elevate the awareness of racial and ethnic discourses. While people who identify within the African diaspora have historically been underrepresented and quite frankly misrepresented, <clears throat> we have had an enormous influence and made meaningful contributions to societal trends and traditions that are still current today. So this Black History Month program is designed to highlight VCU Health's commitment and mission to embracing and encouraging um, a diverse, equitable, and inclusive community in all aspects. This year, the VCU Health Office of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion has adopted the annual theme that you'll see represented throughout the year of empowering community. We are committed to ensuring that we uphold anti-discrimination policies, procedures, and practices in all that we do. We embrace, appreciate, and value what our diverse team members bring to our health system. We are better because of all of our differences. Here at VCU Health, we celebrate the Black history and culture every day, not just during February, and continue to be committed to our commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So in saying that, I am absolutely honored to welcome Ms. Frida Wilkins who will open our program today by reading one of my most favorite poems and hers, The Hill We Climb by Amanda Gorman. Um, Frida is a clinical social worker with VCU Health System, Macy Cancer Center. Much of Frida's work involves assisting patients and families in addressing the psychological aspects of living with cancer. She holds a master of social work from Virginia Commonwealth University School of Social Work right here in Richmond, and a Master of Divinity from the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology 
at Virginia Union University. Frida is also an ordained Baptist minister and a certified spiritual director. She has worked extensively in the field of oncology for over 40 years. She has worked in outpatient and ambulatory settings, as well as having provided social work in home health and hospice settings. Just prior to returning to VCU Health, Ms. Wilkins, excuse me, Ms. Wilkins was involved in transplant policy development and the United Network of Organ Sharing. In addition to providing social work, support to individual patients, families, Frida offers support through support groups for women living with cancer and cancer survivors. She also facilitates a biweekly mindful group that focuses on cancer patients and families, but is open to the entire community. Frida sees her mission as living at the intersection of spirituality and clinical care. Thank you, Frida, for your powerful voice today and welcome. Mute. You're on mute, Ms. Wilkins. Thank you so much. And good day, everyone. And if you would indulge me as I began to prepare for today, my heart went back to Wayman AME Church in Enfield, North Carolina, 12 miles from the nearest town and doing Children's Day and Christmas programs. My mother was the coordinator and this was before there were microphones in little country churches. And my mother would stand at the front and yell to my father and the other men in the back, can you hear them? That was the deal. And so as I began today and share with you, allow me to say to my mother, they hear me. It is my honor today to share the poem from Amanda Gorman, The Hill We Climb. When day comes, we ask ourselves, where can we find light in this never ending shade? The loss we carry, a sea we must wade. We brave the belly of the beast. We've learned that quiet isn't always peace and the norms and notions of what just is, isn't always justice. And yet the dawn is ours before we know it. Somehow we do it. Somehow we weathered and witnessed a nation that isn't broken, but simply unfinished. We, the successors of a country and a time where a skinny black girl descended from slaves and raised by a single mother can dream of becoming president only to find herself reciting to one. And yes, we are far from polished, far from pristine, but that doesn't mean we are striving to form a union that is perfect. We are striving to form our union with purpose, to compose a country committed to all cultures, colors, characters, and conditions of man. And so we lift our gaze, not to what stands between us, but what stands before us. We close the divide because we know to put our future first, we must first put our differences aside. We lay down our arms so we can reach out our arms to one another. We seek harm to none and harmony for all. Let the globe, if nothing else, say this is true, that even as we grieved, we grew, that even as we hurt, we hoped that even as we tired, we tried, that we'll forever be tied together victorious. Not because we will never again know defeat, but because we will never again sow 
division. Scripture tells us to envision that everyone shall lie, shall sit under their own vine and fig tree, and no one shall make them afraid. If we're to live up to our own time, then victory won't lie in the blade, but in all the bridges we've made. That is the promise of glade, the hill we climb, if only we dare. It's because being American is more than a pride we inherit. It's the past we step into and how we repair it. We've seen a force that would shatter our nation rather than share it, would destroy our country if it meant delaying democracy. And this effort very nearly succeeded. But while democracy can be periodically delayed, it can never be permanently defeated. In this truth, in this faith we trust, for while we have our eyes on the future, history has its eyes on us. This is the era of just redemption. We feared at its inception. We did not feel prepared to be the heirs of such a terrifying hour. But within it, we found the power to author a new chapter, to offer hope, and laughter to ourselves. So while once we ask, how could we possibly prevail over catastrophe? Now we assert, how could catastrophe possibly prevail over us? We will not march back to what was, but move to what shall be, a country that is bruised but whole, benevolent but bold, fierce and free. We will not be turned around or interrupted by intimidation because we know our inaction and inertia will be the inheritance of the next generation because the future, our blunders become their burdens. But one thing is certain. If we merge mercy with might and might with right, then love becomes our legacy and change our children's birthright. So let us leave behind a country better than the one we were left. Every breath from my bronze pounded chest, we will raise this wounded world into a wondrous one. We will rise from the golden hills of the West. We will rise from the windswept Northeast where our forefathers first realized revolution. We will rise from the lake rim cities of the Midwestern states. We will rise from the sun-baked South. We will rebuild, reconcile, and recover. And every known rock of our nation and every corner called our country, our people, diverse and beautiful, will emerge battered and beautiful. When day comes, we step out of the shade of flame and unafraid. The new day balloons as we free it for there is always light, if only we're brave enough to see it, if only we're brave enough to see it. Oh, wow. I think we all need to take a big, deep breath. I'm going to say this, Frida. We see you, we hear you, and we are absolutely inspired by you. Thank you. You represent so many voices of change in our world today. 
that's the reason why we're so moved. And I am honored to share your presence today and your kindness. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think that Frida has done just a beautiful, outstanding job in helping us, uplifting us to introduce our keynote today. So I wanna welcome everyone. I wanna welcome Dr. Amy Tillerson Brown. Dr. Amy Tillerson Brown, she's the Dean of the Mary Baldwin College for Women in Mary Baldwin University. Dr. Tillerson Brown has forged a distinguished career in a variety of academic leadership roles, including as professor of history, history department chair, and director of both the African-American studies program and public history program. She is also a founding member and current co-lead of MBU's Coalition of Racial and Social Justice an advisor for the university's chapter of National History, Honor Society, Phi Alpha Theta. Her most recent scholarly research anal um, um, analyzes the activism of Black women in Prince Edward County before and during the public school crisis of the 1950s and 60s. This research is entitled Negotiating Intersections of Gender, Social Class, and Race, Black Women in Prince Edward County, Virginia, Activists and Community Builders, 1920 to 1965. Dr. Tillerson Brown's research examines the activism of Black PEC women who, despite less than optimal economic conditions and traditional negative assumptions associated with their race and gender, networked to build their communities. Dr. Tilson Brown is also a senior fellow and strategic consultant post at the Mooton Museum in Farmville, Virginia. In 2013, Dr. Tilson Brown produced a documentary, Voices from the Port Republic Road, focusing on the experiences of alumni from the Rosenwald School. This project documents the interconnectedness of school church and business and the mid 20th century rural black community, along with the challenges of public school segregation and integration. Other research interests of Dr. Tillerson Brown include the activism and resistance of women of Native American descent in Virginia and the Carolinas and race and criminalization in Virginia, 1870 to 1950. She has presented papers on both topics at recent Association for the Study of African American Life and History Conferences. Dr. Tillerson Brown encourages our community to embrace this opportunity today to listen and be inspired by her own experiences as a historian focused on, focusing on African American studies and critical race theory and fighting for equitable rights and freedom in our world today. Welcome, Dr. Tillerson Brown. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. I am very, very happy uh, to be with you all today. I'm going to take a second and make sure that I can share my screen okay. Uh, and you all will have to suffer through one of my PowerPoints. <laughs> I'm glad, very, very um. Uh, Glad to be with you all uh, on today. So today I'm gonna talk a little bit about historical perspectives of racial inequity in healthcare. And after the semicolon, I have believe black women. Uh, and I think the more and more we, we talk, you'll understand why I have that semicolon there. Consider Montgomery, Alabama in the 1840s. Three enslaved African women, Ann Archer, Lucy and Betsy lived and worked on neighboring plantations. The Atlantic slave trade that transported Africans from the African mainland to the Americas in the bowels of slave ships was outlawed a generation or so earlier in 1807. 
Since importing humans from Africa was illegal, slave owners forced the reproduction of enslaved people by requiring sexual relations between males and females. And Archer, Lucy, and Betsy were designated breeders on their plantations. As breeders, these women were often pregnant. And Archer Westcott, who had rickets due to malnutrition and a vitamin D deficiency, was pregnant at age 17. The shape of Ann Archer's pelvis made childbirth difficult. After 72 hours of labor, her slave master called Dr. J. Marion Sims for assistance. But Sims' expertise did not prevent the severe tearing of Ann Archer's vagina and rectum. In fact, this condition, vesicovaginal and rectovaginal fistulae, that caused severe tearing and loss of control of bladders and bowels was common especially among enslaved women. Lucy and Betsy were also plagued with the condition, which was not only embarrassing, but also caused severe infection. Dr. Sims had a doctor's office in Montgomery, and he leased an Archer, Lucy and Betsy from their owners for gynecological, gynecological experimentation. An Archer, Lucy and Betsy were considered property and were not required to consent to the use of their bodies for these experiments. Lucy was the first of the three women to endure Sims' experimental operation. She lay naked and restrained on an operating table in front of several other white doctors for approximately an hour long surgery. She was awake and conscious the entire time because Sims did not use anesthesia as he believed black women did not feel the pain the way that white women did a racist misconception that continues today. Post-surgery, Lucy developed an infection and was in excruciating pain for days. Sims cured the infection, but the injury did not heal. Sims did not abandon his mission, however. Again, without anesthesia, he surgically inserted this device that he had created for Betsy's bladder. While Betsy did not succumb to infection, the tear was not repaired. And Archer was uh, operated on last with the same result. With three unsuccessful surgeries, local doctors lost interest in supporting Sims's experiments. And Archer, Betsy, and Lucy were left in Sims' control as they were considered useless to the families that had purchased them. These women worked for the Sims family as they recovered from the experimental surgeries. When Sims decided to continue his experimentation, and Archer, Betsy, and Lucy worked as his assistants. They learned how to care for each other during this surgical experiment uh, for the next five years. Sims practiced this surgical procedure on 12 women, but only Ann Archa, Betsy, and Lucy were named in his published reports. In summer 1849, after Ann Archa's 30th operation, her injury finally healed, and she made a full recovery. Sims moved his practice to New York, and Ann Archa, Betsy, and Lucy all returned to their plantations as slaves. In 2018, the statue of Sims erected in Central Park was removed. Other statues of Sims exist in his birth state of South Carolina and Alabama, where he uh, opened his first practice and experimented on those three enslaved women. Sims' work revolutionized surgical treatments for women and earned him the nickname, the father of modern gynecology. But it must be acknowledged that these advancements were made through the exploitation of enslaved women's bodies. In 1920, about 75 years after the medical experimentation of Ann Archer, Betsy, and Lucy, Loretta Pleasance was born in Roanoke, Virginia. Her family called her Henny. In 1924, when Henny was four years old, her family prepared for the birth of their 10th child. Unfortunately, her mother, Eliza Pleasance, died giving birth to this 10th child. And Henny's father, Johnny, was not able to care for such a large family alone. So he moved his family from Roanoke to Clover, Virginia, 
where the children stayed with various relatives. Henny stayed with her mother's grandfather and shared a room with her first cousin, David Lax. Their mothers were sisters who she married 17 years later. Before the couple exchanged nuptials, they had two children, Lawrence and Elsie. Elsie had epilepsy and cerebral palsy and died at the Hospital for the Negro Insane, later named Crownsville Hospital Center in 1955 at the age of 15. Following the migratory patterns of so many African-American men, David went to work in Bethlehem Steel at Sparrows Point, Maryland. The family bought a home in Turner Station and welcomed two more boys and another girl to their family. Since the Johns Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore was one of a very few to treat poor Black people, Henny went there when she started to show symptoms of cervical cancer. Dr. George Geek Gay collected samples of cancer cells from all of his patients, Johns Hopkins says. But like, unlike the cells of other patients, Henrietta's cells did not die, but doubled daily. Though Henny died in 1951 at 31 years old, because of the rapid growth of the HeLa cells, as they were called, scientists have been able to study the effects of viruses, including COVID-19, toxins, drugs, et cetera, without having to experiment on humans. Like Ann Archer, Betsy, and Lucy, Henny did not give consent for her cells to be used. But the story of Henrietta Lacks also illustrates the racial inequities that are embedded in the United States research and healthcare systems. Lacks was a Black woman. The hospital where her cells were collected was one of only a few that provided medical care for Black people. None of the biotechnology or other companies that profited from her cells sent any of that money to her family. And for decades after her death, Doctors and scientists repeatedly failed to ask her family for consent as they revealed Lack's name publicly, gave her medical records to the media, and even published uh, her cells genomes online. The medical establishment has a long history of mistreating Black Americans, from the gruesome experiments on enslaved people to the forced sterilizations of Black women and the infamous Tus Tuskegee syphilis study that withheld treatment from hundreds of Black men for decades to let doctors track and course the disease. So it's not surprising that in November 2021, just 42% of Black Americans said they'd be willing to take the COVID-19 vaccine. Unfortunately, nearly 170 years after our Archa, Betsy, and Lucy, statistics reveal that Black women are three times more likely to die from pregnancy and child-related uh, and childbirth-related causes. Pregnancy-related deaths are defined as the death of a woman during pregnancy or within a year of the end of pregnancy from pregnancy complications. A chain of events initiated by pregnancy or the aggravation of an unrelated condition by the physiological effects of pregnancy, according to the CDC. Today, Black women too often fall victim to doctors' racial bias and other structural discrimination once they are in the hospitals. Say her name. Kira Dixon Johnson, 39, died April 13, 2016, after bleeding internally, oops, after bleeding internally for more than 10 hours following a routine C-section. She left behind two sons. Dr. Shalon Irving, 36, died January 28, 2017 three weeks after giving birth to her daughter. Irving was an epidemiologist at the CDC and researched how structural inequity affected how health outcomes. Dr. Irving's complications from hypertension led to cardiac arrest. Hypertension and preeclampsia are two of the leading causes of maternal deaths, and studies have shown that these chronic conditions can result from psycho psychological stress created by systemic and societal racism. Amber Rose Isaac, age 26, died April 21st, 2020, after an emergency C-section. 
Isaac died days after tweeting that she wanted to write a tell-all about the un incompetent doctors that were caring for her at her hospital. If none of those names sound familiar to you, I bet you've heard the name Serena Williams a time or two. Despite her status as a tennis icon, Serena Williams endured near-death childbirth experience like tens of thousands of other Black women in the United States. When unable to breathe freely after delivery, Serena Williams requested a CT with Doppler drip. She knew that she had a history of blood clots. The medical professional from whom she requested help thought the pain meds had confused her and that intervention was unnecessary. Williams was rushed into emergency surgery to stop the blood clots that she knew had been forming. Thankfully, she recovered. Black women are disproportionately likely to face these complications, and they are also more likely to fall victim to America's ongoing maternal mortality crisis, being three or four times more likely than white women to die from pregnancy-related complications. In March 2020, Representative Lauren Underwood warned her fellow lawmakers that maternal mortality rates were a public health crisis that had to be addressed with policy change. Stemming from historical and ongoing racism and inequity, racial disparities in maternal health must be addressed. Underwood introduced the Black Maternal Health Momnibus, a legislative package with an unprecedented focus on Black moms designed to address the maternal health crisis in the United States. As previously stated, Black women are three times more likely than their white counterparts to die from pregnancy-related causes. And this statistic does not capture the many people experiencing pregnancy complications and near misses. Days after Underwood introduced Momnibus, the World Health Organization declared COVID a pandemic, forcing businesses and schools closed while we socially distanced, wore masks, and waited for a vaccine. In February 2021, the Black Maternal Health Momnibus was reintroduced. This suite of 12 bills addressed issues ranging from the societal determinants of health, maternal mental health, perinatal workforce development, and the effects of climate change to the unique circumstances facing incarcerated individuals and veterans. The pandemic has also further exposed how racism and bias in the medical system uh, can have deadly consequences for communities of color. Two momnibus bills would address this issue by funding bias and racism training programs for maternity care providers and investing in research. Crucially, key progress has been made to advance this legislation. The Build Back Better Act, the flagship societal infrastructure practice spearheaded by President Joe Biden, includes historic investments in a number of provisions for this legislation. Hopefully, policy like this will alter staggering statistics related to Black maternal morbidity. But what accounts for the disparities in the first place? Among the explanations, providers spend less time with Black patients ignore their symptoms and complaints, and lose contact with them during the postpartum period when women undergo major physiological changes and put them at the risk of death. The question is why do providers spend less time with Black patients? Why do they ignore the symptoms and complaints of Black women? And why are they less likely to keep con contact during postpartum? According to Dr. Kira M. Bridges, professor of law and professor of anthropology at Boston University, Black people are simply not receiving the same quality of health care that their white counterparts received. And this second rate health care is shortening their lives. The Association of Medical Colleges reported that in 2019, 56% of active physicians were white and 5% Black. Whites are about 62% of the US population and Blacks about 12% for context. 
Scholars like Bridges contend that racial bias plays a key role in these outcomes, as do structural barriers. Racism consists of structures, policies, and practices and norms that assign value and determines opportunity based on the way people look or the color of their skin. Studies have found Black Americans are consistently undertreated for pain relative to white patients. One revealed half of medical students and residents held one or more false beliefs about supposed biological differences between Black and white patients, like the former have a higher tolerance for pain than the latter. This is the logic that guided Sims' decisions not to anesthetize Anarcha, Betsy, and Lucy when experimenting with their bodies. Dr. Bridges notes another study of 400 hospitals in the United States that showed that Black patients with heart disease received inferior and more conservative treatments than their white counterparts. Black patients were less likely to receive coronary bypass uh, operations, and after surgery, they were discharged earlier from the hospital than white patients at a stage when discharge was inappropriate. Perhaps more disturbing is that Black patients were more likely to receive less desirable treatments. For instance, the rates at which Black patients have their limbs amputated is higher than those for white patients. Additionally, Black patients suffering from bipolar disorder are more likely to be treated with antipsychotics despite evidence that these medications have long-term negative effects and are not effective. In light of these studies, the argument is that if people of color are sicker and dying at younger ages than white people, this may be because physi some physicians have racial biases. Their biases cause them to give their patients of color inferior health care, and in so doing, contribute to the higher rates of morbidity and mortality. If physicians harbor racial biases, then these biases can either be conscious, held consciously or unconsciously. Dana Bowen Matthews' book, Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality and in American Healthcare, published in 2015, explores the idea that unconscious bias held by healthcare providers might explain racial disparities in health. She notes that uh, precious few physicians, like the general public, admit to harboring negative attitudes about any particular racial group. They have views about racial minorities of which they are not consciously aware, views that lead them to make unintentional and ultimately harmful judgments about people of color. Proposed omnibus legislation includes components that address uh, bias for training physicians with hopes to curb the impact that physicians' impl implicit racial bias account for racial disparities in health. As the, maternity, as the maternal morality crisis deepens, Blacks are not waiting for laws to change in attempt to improve their fates. The number of Black doulas, for example, has increased. While the real solution to reversing these st uh, statistics is an end to structural racism in medicine, Black pregnant people are now relying on, on another way to make their birthing experience safer. Doulas are trained professionals who provide support to mothers before, during, and after childbirth. Studies show that having a doula present while giving birth has led to a decrease in the preterm birth or low birth rate, better communication between lower income earning pregnant people of color and their health care providers, and a reduction of the rate of C-sections, which are higher among Black women. Why Black women die at a higher rate than any other race during childbirth is the result of a web of factors, experts say. One reason for the disparity is that more Black women of childbearing age have chronic diseases such as high blood pressure and diabetes, which increase the risk of pregnancy-related complications like preeclampsia and possibly the need for emergency C-sections, according to the CDC. The Implicit bias works in tandem with structural factors responsible for racial disparities in health. A growing body of research shows that centuries of racism in this country has had a profound and negative impact on communities of color. The impact is pervasive and deeply embedded in our society, affecting where one lives, learns, works, worship, and plays, and creates inequities to, uh, in access to a range of social and economic benefits such as housing, education, wealth, and employment. 
These conditions, often referred to as the social determinants of health, are key drivers of health inequities within communities of color, placing those within these populations at greater risk for poor health outcomes. Disparities we have discussed today have historic roots and are evident in healthcare because racial disparities are evident in nearly every other facet of American life. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Dr. Tillerson Brown. Thank you very much. Um, do you have um, do you have more of your PowerPoint? Well, no, I didn't mean to do okay. that. <laughs> I was trying to actually move this up and stop sharing the the, the okay. screen. My apologies. Yeah. No, 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 that's wonderful. Um, you definitely, I'll tell you that you definitely have um, shared so much and have answered a lot of questions that people have already asked. Um, will, are you okay to entertain a couple of Absolutely. other questions? Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. So these Stop are some questions. So, so that I didn't Absolutely. So on. These, <laughs> these are some questions um, and, um, and I'll make sure that on our time here, um, the first question we have for you is um, that was presented are what questions can we begin to ask and how can we examine the, practice, the practices in healthcare to reduce the instances of racism for black patients, especially as you were talking about women during pregnancy and after. So what are those questions that we need to start asking? Gosh, without... <laughs> You know, that's a really, really good question. Uh, what, what, what questions do we ask? Uh, you know, I'll just talk from my personal experience. Uh, sure. I, I look for referrals, right? Because no matter what you see on a website, no matter how many credentials that someone may have, that personal interaction, whether or not you really feel as though uh, the medical professional has your best interest in heart, at heart, or if you're just someone that they're checking off of a list, really is a personal relationship. Uh, I hate to say, go with your gut but your gut really matters. Uh, and, and even in selecting uh, people to, to take over mm -hmm. is such a very critically important role in our lives. I, I don't think uh, for asking for references for, from trusted people is, is a bad idea. Uh, I also say that when you get, uh, when you get in a, a situation with a healthcare provider and something starts to tell you that something's going wrong, listen to that. As we're asking larger society and medical professionals to believe Black women when they say they're in pain, to believe Black women when they say that this is a pre-existing condition and I know you're going to have to do that, we also have to believe ourselves. So when something in our spirit, sometimes it's the ancestors whispering to you, right, <laughs> tells you this isn't right, I think we should trust that and look until we find a fit that is good because this care is critical, not just for us as individuals, but for everyone that comes in contact with us and, 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 and um, especially our children, right? Because when we're not right, they're not right, yeah. Absolutely, and I appreciate that because I think oftentimes um, many people are afraid to find other healthcare providers, often healthcare providers who look like me. <laughs> and so I think that was very powerful. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we have another question here. What are some of the ways um, to give more exposure to, quite frankly, the racist structures that exist in healthcare in the United States? You've done that for us today. What other ways can we do that? Well, and this is where I think, uh, well, I think that VCU has, haven't you all created a task force that deals with, with these issues amongst professionals and, and hospitals to where, where we're actually having these conversations, right? Uh, 20 years ago, I think that when women would come and complain about things like this, they would be put off. I think the fact that we are coming together as larger communities, health providers, academics, right, uh, general public, just to share our experiences 
truth. I think that's a major first step. Uh, I even like the fact that policy is getting involved. And I know that, you know, that's a conversation that people are two different sides of the coin. But what, what I've noticed is that uh, lots of these changes, especially do that relate to discriminatory practices have not been ameliorated without uh, some policy change. So I'm hopeful with that policy change that we'll start to see a brighter future and a decrease in the rates of black death that we think are uh, impacted by uh, implicit racial bias. Um, I hope so too. Just, as with teachers, you know, you think of teachers and the roles that they play with their biases. Uh, I look forward to a day or a time when college curriculum is going to include how to recognize, because one point that we mentioned earlier uh, is that some people have no idea that they are operating within the vein of implicit racial bias and ma making them aware, uh, which is hard. That, uh, that reflective self is it, not easy, but it is so critically important, not only to the oaths that we take as educators and doctors to provide you know, good quality care, but also to the people that we treat. I think it's just that important to take a step back and make sure we're doing what we know is necessary to uh, arm our next generation of academic uh, medical providers with um, this type of training and awareness. I'm, thank you. I'm glad you brought up the school system because I've got a pretty big question that is, that is directly connected to what you shared with us. Sure. Um, and uh, you and I have talked about this before. This is a, I hate to say it's a hot topic because it's an important one. <laughs> so the question here is, um, if schools ever actually formally allowed teachers to teach critical race theory in school, how does this help understand how racism is shaped? We're talking about what we've talked about today. How can critical race theory in schools, if we're actually able to teach that, change the landscape? And, you know, in not only healthcare, but beyond. And do you what, think it will actually improve racism? Do I think it will improve race relations? Improve. I don't, you know. <laughs> oh, goodness. Well, well, if we look at all of the question. blowback it's gotten over the past year, I, I, I guess what, you know, I'm a prisoner of hope, right? We're going to say that before before the sunshine, the storm must come. So so we're in the throes of a storm right now, but we all believe that that sun, that sun has come. Critical race theory is this, this uh, academic theory that was formed in law schools over in the 1970s, right? And, and what it gets at is that uh, at its very foundation, there are policies and laws in place that have uh, supported and sustained uh, racism in these United States of America. Uh, and it's, it's deeply embedded, it's structural, it's in the water as Robin DiAngelo, who author of Fright, White Fragility says, it's just as American as apple pie, so to speak. Uh, and then come, and, and there's so many, I mean, we can start with the constitution and the three-fifths compromise and Dred Scott and come all the way, all the way uh, up to, to today. But what these scholars decided in the 1970s is that, is that we, we ought to uh, abandon this myth of American exceptionalism and start telling the story of our history and the laws that uh, have governed that history in a way that's more factual. Now, to some folk, it's not palatable. How dare you say that the American nation is, a, is an inherently racist uh, uh, a country. And I'm not sure that they're saying it's inherently racist. I think they're just taking a survey of the laws and the policy that have come out and are able to point to certain laws and policy and say, no, this actually is racist. Anytime you're counting human beings as less than a human, anytime the Supreme Court has sanctioned that the black man has no law, no, no rights that the white man is bound to respect, what, what what else do you call it? And then we can come on up to the 1930s if we're if we're um, passing unemployment with Social Security Act and unemployment assurance is not allowed for domestics and agriculturalists. Well, that's not happenstance, right? Uh, so so if we, if if we're not uh, as informed. American citizens able to sit down and take an honest inventory of what has brought us to this point, then we, we will never be able to rectify 
or, or, or bridge the gaps and rifts that exist between us. So, so do I think that critical race theory is, is a bad thing? Absolutely not. <laughs> I, 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 don't, I don't think so. Um, do I understand perspectives unlike mine where folk may not be uh, comfortable listening to those stories? Yes, I understand that as well. And they will probably be as uncomfortable as I was going through an entire history curriculum at the undergraduate level and not hearing anything about contributions of people who looked like me. So, uh, you know, I, I don't think that being uncomfortable, uh, especially in the academic, I think that, that you need that type of uh, mental calisthenics to grow, right? It stretches you and it grows you in ways that uh, you're all the better for. So yes, bring on critical race theory. Yes. Thank you for that. I agree with you. Thank you so very much. Um, so the next, the last question I have, and um, I'll close out the program after this. Um, where do you see us in regards to race relations in, you know, 10 years? <laughs> 10 years. I want to tell you what, um, well, let, let me see. I, I don't <laughs> on the call so, so <laughs> let me um let me scale back a bit in 10 years 10 years so 2032 well 2032 what census uh people who do demographics tell us is, is that we're going to be a much more multicultural uh nation um right. And I'm happy about that. And I think that when you get people from different perspectives that are actually influencing policies in the ways that you all are gathered on this call doing right now, that change will come. So in 10 years, we're going to be closer to better than we are today. And for that reason, I'm hopeful. I am as well. Thank you. I am very hopeful. Um, I'm hopeful because of the many children we have as well hours included. Um, well, I want to end by thanking you, Dr. Tillerson Brown. Um, you have absolutely inspired us today. I appreciate your incredible knowledge and um, just the power you bring to the table is fantastic. And thank you so much for that. I also want to thank everyone who participated today. Um, again, thank you, Muzi, um, and the Office of Healthcare Arts um, here at VCU Health. Um, I really appreciate you making this happen today and helping us with this. Um, and we would not be able to have a program like this without um, Dr. Marcel Davis, who drives our work and inspires us to be better and make a positive change in our world today. So thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, and I wanna encourage everyone here today to continue to participate in black history programming as um, Muzi said earlier today. And also I wanna encourage everyone to please look at our diversity, equity, and inclusion intranet page so you can see future programs that are happening. Um, on February 23rd, we are having a diversity, inclusion, reconciliation, and equity conversations, dire conversations. And we're going to be talking about how Black history is history. Um, and uh, I also would encourage everyone to join us next month for Women's History Month. Uh, we are hosting a program entitled A Woman Speaks, uh, celebrating Women's History Month through the power of poetry. And I want to thank you, Frida, for starting that powerful voice for us today. Thank you everyone for being here today and I appreciate each of you. I hope you have a beautiful week and keep celebrating black history because black history is history. Thank you everyone. Thank you.